Hey there kids, it's me, Mr. Creepy Pasta, and I just wanted to tell you about one quick thing before we get started. If you guys want to check out My Tiny Town Just Got Put on Lockdown in its full entire published novel form, you can. It's available now on Amazon, and you can find a link to it in the description down below. And now, on to tonight's story. Day 60. Yesterday was pretty uneventful, other than the fact that we made it an entire day with virtually no incidents and just driving. We finally found an interstate earlier this morning and came across a bigger town that has a massive truck stop just on the edge right off the interstate. We parked at the top of the off-ramp and started an adult meeting to decide our plan of attack. The whole time my mind was flooded with hope that the items I was hoping for would be in there. We sat at the top of what seemed like an unnecessarily large hill for an overpass and off-ramp, and sadly, with other equally tall grass and tree-covered hills surrounding us, all we could see was the big truck stop. Even then, we could only see about three-quarters of the buildings, and nothing else further into town. I peered through the scope of the rifle to get a better look while Brandy used a pair of nice binoculars, passing them back and forth between the other adults so they could see. I'm still not quite sure where she even got them, but I'm happy that she had them. I don't see any movement other than the flag waving in the wind out front. I do see that some of the front windows have been smashed, so this place may have already been ransacked, I said at last, with a notable hint of disappointment in my voice. Nobody really responded to my comment, but we all made the decision to go together using the strength and numbers idea. That way, if anything happened, we'd all be there to deal with it, and there would be no delay in information, if we all needed to bolt out of there quickly. We drove slowly down to the building, doing our best to avoid any sort of big announcement that we were there, if anything or anyone did happen to be in the area. Shit, I said under my breath as we pulled into the parking lot and looked off down the road into the town. That menacing gray and purple swirling fog floated through the air in the depths of the town. What is it? Grace said as she heard my soft exclamation. I just pointed down the street in response and she instantly knew the significance of what I meant. We all pulled up right next to the main door, and Grace grabbed the rifle, even with it being her least favorite weapon, and stood by the passenger side door guarding the vehicle while I grabbed the bow and went to search the building. Grant and Brandy chose the same setup, with Brandy standing guard with Grace, armed with a shotgun that she had never fired before, while Grant took his bow and followed me inside. As we walked into the building, I noticed a few of the tiny gecko creatures crawling around, and after we entered the building, Bodhi hopped out of the SUV and spent his time chasing them around, pouncing and killing them. The kids sat together in the back of the vehicle, giggling and making noises at each other to keep themselves occupied. A sudden assault on my senses nearly caused me to retch and vomit. The smell of pure rot and decay hit me in the face like a freight train. Once I composed myself from the burning assault on my nostrils, I found it odd that we couldn't smell it at all from the outside of the building. Grant and I slowly crept through the building around the toppled shelves and broken coolers. It looked like an all-out war had raged inside the truck stop. We found one body behind the counter, laid out flat in its back with its stomach and ribs, looking like they had exploded out from the inside. I'm no doctor, though, so it could have been eaten by some animal or some of the creatures. Either way, it looked brutal. We found another corpse laying inside. We found another corpse laying half inside a janitor's closet near the back of the building. This one was slightly less decayed, but was covered with little gecko-like creatures who apparently had a very strange mouth, because they were all attached to the body like leeches, just feeding on it. Every so often, they would puff little clouds of purple fog, and moments later, another little gecko would crawl over and begin feeding like the others. Holy shit, you were right! They were like little scouts, the creatures using the fog like ants or bees. It's like a pheromone trail for them. When one dies, it lets out a cloud signal that the area needs help or, or, or to attack. And these little guys are letting out little puffs telling others where their food is. That's why it has no effect on us. It's not terraforming or toxic or anything. It's just, it's one of the ways they communicate with each other. I yelled with excitement in my realization, even though Grant had been standing right next to me. Yeah, that's really interesting, dude, but why don't you shut the fuck up and stop yelling? Grant Whisper yelled at me in response. Uh, right, sorry. Let's hurry this up and get out of here, I whispered back. 
We each took separate aisles and split up, searching for the rest of the building. Just as I expected, I saw a glass case filled with different models of CB radios. I was nearly overjoyed at the sight of this. I would have immediately broken the glass out, but part of one of the shelves had already fallen over and done it for me. I reached in and grabbed two of the best in vehicle radios that they had, along with a pack of handheld versions. Next to the case was a wall filled with different types of antennas, microphones, speakers, various other accessories for radios. There had also been a large glass case with some standard pocket knives, all the way up to cheap katana sets and various other fantasy knives. Now, I know that fantasy knives don't really hold any edge very well, and they're really just for display only, but I couldn't help myself. I had to grab this interesting hand basket type deal that was actually a handle with six nearly foot-long blades pointing in the same direction around your fist. It was highly unnecessary for me to grab, and I may not ever even get to use it. But I think the fact that it was so ridiculous was the very reason that I had to snag it. Grant made some rounds, but was ultimately unable to find very much viable supplies to help us. He met me over by the cases and helped me gather the radios and antenna mounts and antennas. High quality, handheld microphones, external speakers, and everything else that we would need to hook the radios up and allow us to talk to each other easier without needing to stop each time. Just then, I heard Bodhi whine, and a few seconds later, a shot rang out, then another. Grace stood by the SUV door watching as Grant and I walked into the building. As she looked down at the rifle in her hands, she really wished she had more practice with anything bigger than a pistol. She talked with Brandy softly as they watched Bodhi chase the little lizard creatures around and pounce on them. They talked about how neither of them was very comfortable with how big the guns they had been given were. But Grace was thankful that she had at least fired a shotgun and a rifle this size a few times before, so she wasn't completely unfamiliar with it the way that Brandy was. It had been nearly 15 minutes since Grant and I had went inside the building, and although it was comforting to hear the girls giggling inside the SUV, both she and Brandy were beginning to get bored. Suddenly, a quiet scream rang out from the side of the building, and Bodie ran off after it. Grace cried out at him to stop and come back, but he seemed to be on a mission and wasn't listening to her. She ran after him and heard him yelp and whine just as she rounded the corner. Oh no, not again, she thought as the scenario came into view. Bodhi had clearly taken a good bite and injured one of the spider creatures that was just starting to stand back up. Bodhi was locked into a horrific staring contest with another and blood dripped down his shoulder. Not wanting to allow another loss, she instantly knelt and rested her forward elbow on her knee to steady and brace her aim. Holding her breath, she fought back tears and anxiety as she looked through the scope. She took aim and squeezed the trigger slowly like she was taught. The gun surprised her when it finally went off, and the wounded spider creature exploded in a shower of purple fluid. Her heart skipped a beat with excitement at taking such a good shot. Bodhi whimpered, still caught in the mental assault from the creature, as Grace chambered another round and aimed for the remaining spider. Just as she held her breath again, a scream pierced the air from behind her, and panic began to rise. One thing at a time, she thought to herself, as she focused her aim, and again the gun firing made her jump, and the spider exploded where it stood. She ran to Bodhi and picked him up just as the sound of the shotgun firing went off back around the front of the building. Grace carried Bodhi and the gun as fast as she could around the front to see that Brandy had shot at a lurker but missed most of her shot, only doing minimal damage. She sat Bodhi down and raised her gun. Brandy pumped the shotgun and fired again, hitting the lurker but missing most of the shot. Bodhi fought through his injury and ran at the beast, lunging and sinking his teeth into the creature's neck. As Bodhi jerked his head back and forth trying to rip off chunks or break the lurker's neck, it reached up and drug a talon down his side. He suddenly released and limped off as quickly as he could as he whimpered. Bodhi's quick attack to the beast gave Grace just enough time to settle in and take aim. As soon as he was clear of the shot, both women fired at the same time. Spatters of purple blood shot in all directions as the creature fell limp. Just as Grant and I came out of the building. With both our arms full, I looked at Grant, at the sound of the two gunshots. Without even speaking, we both realized some shit was going down outside. Another two shots rang out as we ran to the front of the building as fast as we could. As we came through the door, we were met with a shocking sight. Bodhi was off to the side, bleeding. A wounded lurker shot maybe 20 feet from the vehicle, and just as my foot hit the asphalt outside, both women fired simultaneously and the creature fell dead. It expelled a large cloud of the purple gas, and my eyes widened with dread now that I had a theory of what that meant. Trevin, we, ha we gotta go now! Grace yelled as she ran over to pick up Bodhi. 
Holy shit, what happened? I'll tell you on the way, throw that shit in the back and help me get Bodie inside. I quickly threw the radio supplies in the vehicle and swung the door open so she could put Bodie inside. Grant and Brandy sped off as Grace and I climbed into the vehicle and followed closely after them. A huge billowing roar from one of the behemoths erupted through the sky as we pulled away. Bodie whined and whimpered from the back and Grace climbed over the center console, grabbing the first aid kit along the way. Mommy, Bodie's hurt, Addie said as Grace made her way past her. I know, Addie, don't worry, I'm gonna fix his owies. He yelped at first, but soon graciously allowed her to clean and wrap his wounds. Luckily, even though they had been bleeding a lot, they weren't very deep. And it hadn't been anything too severe. Using a bottle of water, Grace rinsed out and cleaned Bodie's cuts as best she could. Using all we had left of the triple antibiotic gel and gauze, she wrapped him up and gave him a couple tablets of painkillers. Bodie licked her hand in response as a thank you and passed out as Grace made her way back up front. Is Bodie all better now? Bodie's my puppy. I love him. Yes, sweetheart. Bodie's gonna be okay. He loves you too. That's why he gives you kisses. Grace responded to Addie as she climbed back up to the passenger seat. Grace and I began to talk about what each of us had been through at the truck stop. Well, more of what she had been through and what I had discovered. After I told her my new theory about what the purpose of the fog was, she agreed by saying that it made a lot of sense. But she also thought there was probably more to it than just that. I knew she was right to a certain extent. That was all I had to observe. So I told her we would need to see more to figure out the rest of the question and its answers. Daddy, I miss May May. Grace and I met eyes before I finally responded to my daughter's statement. Me too, baby girl. Me too. A few more miles down the road and Grant pulled off to the side ahead of us. As I got out, he opened his door and shouted at me that he just wanted to get the radios hooked up before we got too much further. We couldn't get the tools we needed to actually mount them like we really should have, but with each wire, a pocket knife, and a little can-do attitude, we got them installed well enough. We tested them out and surprisingly they worked. Shit, we didn't grab any batteries for the handheld walkies, I said, rather upset at the thought. I grabbed some before we found them. Grant responded. Hope they're the right size. Luckily, they were the right size, and after getting them installed, the little handheld walkies crackled to life. We did some quick testing of all the radios and flipped them through the different channels, and an unfamiliar choppy male voice caught our attention. Hello? Anybody there? Silence hung into the air between us as we looked at each other, not really knowing what to do. Please! Anyone! Need help! Trap! Who is this? Where are you? Grace's voice sounded over the walkie in my hand, causing us all to look at the SUV where she was sitting in the passenger seat with the CB mic in her hand. And that, that, a trap just outside, in the house. Peace everywhere. I watched as Grace threw her arms up and shot us at, did anyone catch that? Look on her face. He's trapped in some sort of house just outside of some town, surrounded by creatures, I responded. Where are you? Grace said over the radio again. Everything fell silent as we waited for a response, but the thought running through my mind was screaming that regardless of what the man said, we barely had any idea where we were, let alone how to get to him. I did know he was close, though, because the radios only had about 5 to 15 mile range. Side Wallace! Wait, 25... Three. Another round of confused looks cascaded over us as we struggled to make out what the man was saying. Looking around, just searching for any form of landmark or anything I could use to figure out where we were alongside the interstate. I saw a sign up ahead and pointed to it, causing Grant and Brandy to turn their heads. Look, Highway 25, two miles. That must be what he was trying to say. I thought I heard him say Wallace. Do you think that's his name? Grant said. No idea, but should we... Should we go help? Or stay out of it, I replied. Hey guys, let's go help this guy. We hear Grace yell from the SUV. The rest of us meet eyes and just kind of shrug before returning to our vehicles. Grant and Brandy pull off down the road first and we follow closely behind. As we pull off the interstate for the exit for Highway 25, another sign points left saying a town named Wallace was located in that direction. 
I guess... That answers the question of if Wallace was the guy's name or not, I thought to myself as we turned down the road. After a few miles, I saw the one thing I now dreaded most over the past two months. In the distance, clouds of the purple-gray fog floated over the road, just beyond the welcome sign of the town called Wallace. Grant stopped off to the side of the road, leaving considerable distance between us and the swirling purple haze. We heard Brandy's voice emerge from the radio speaker. Yeah, I'm not liking this. How are we supposed to know which fucking house this dumbass is in? We haven't heard him over the radio since we started driving. You think he's already dead? She had a very good point. Grace and I sat looking at each other, having a silent conversation about what we needed to do next. I expected to hear the voice come over the radio again, but it remained silent for a few more moments before I responded to Brandy. Yeah, I don't like it much either. The first part of my response directed to the other vehicle the second being directed at the new stranger. Hello? We're just outside of town. Which house are you located in? How do we get to you? A few moments of silence. Static buzzed over the radio before we heard it again. Being so close this time, the voice was much clearer. This is tall two-story white house next to town square. You can see the creatures crawling around the outside. I knew that didn't really give us all that much information, because we didn't know the town, so who knows where the town square was compared to where we were. Nevertheless, I had to answer him to be able to get any info. You said we. How many people are with you? Also, how many of the creatures can you see? What, what kinds are you seeing? I don't know. I can't really count them. We're hiding on the second floor in a bedroom. I'd say there's, there's three or four little ones, a couple of big ones. It's, it's me and my wife. Please help. I don't... I don't know what to do. I looked at Grace and she gave me a look I had trouble deciphering. It was a mix between concerned and cautious, but I wasn't fully sure which one she was trying to convey more. I thought that after hearing what he said, he was meaning the spider creatures as the smaller ones and the lurkers as the big ones, because if there was a couple of behemoths there, I highly doubted the house would still be standing. I grabbed the handheld and stepped out of the vehicle. When the other three adults saw this, they all did the same, and we met in the middle of the two vehicles. Grace, leaving the door open behind her, allowed Bodhi to jump out, and after a quick jog into the grass to relieve himself, he trotted over to us and sat in the middle of our little circle. I looked out to the fog, my brain begging me to not have to go in it. We all stood in silence for a few seconds, looking between each other and off into the fog in town before I turned, looking at the group, and spoke. Okay, just sit tight, I spoke into the radio, before directing my words at everyone else. What do you guys think? What's the plan? Before anyone else spoke up, the voice crackled over the radio. Okay, please hurry. I don't know, man. I don't really like this, Grant spoke up first. I don't think I can just leave someone to die if I know I could help them, Grace said. Yeah, but what if these fuckers just set up a trap for us? Brandy added. But what if it isn't and these people just got caught in a bad situation? I'm kind of with Grace on this one. As much as I don't like it, I don't think I can just leave someone like that. Grant responded. Okay, fine, let's do it. But I think this shit seems sketchy as fuck. Brandy relented. I looked at Grant as everyone else fell silent and looked back at me. After taking a deep breath, I spoke into the walkie again. Just hold tight, man. We're... We're gonna come in and get you. What do you have to work with in there? Any weapons? Do you have a car sitting outside you can get to? Uh, what's the situation so I can have an idea of what we're walking into? Bows? Grant said to me after I finished with the walkie. Yeah, looks like we have a sneak and extract mission. You ready for this? I replied. He took a deep breath and exhaled loudly. Yeah, I guess so. Suddenly, the voice finally answered over the radio. We have a car outside. We have weapons, but we broke them. They all just crept up on us so fast. It, it, it only took a minute or so. And we have... We were surrounded. I looked at everyone else, ending by locking eyes with my wife. I gave her a look, telling her that I was... It was all starting again. She smiled at me before speaking. Brandy, grab your gun. Help me protect the kids. Trevin... You and Grant go in quick. 
and quietly and save those people. Oh, and please, 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 please be careful. Grab your gear. Here we go, man. I said to Grant before turning and kissing Grace and grabbing my bow. Bodhi, you stay here and keep the girls safe, okay? Bodhi wagged his tail and chuffed at me before running back and jumping in the SUV. He looked kind of funny with his shoulder wrapped in bandages, but he also seemed to be getting around normally despite his wounds. If anything happens back here, let us know over the radio. Otherwise, let's try to keep it quiet so we can sneak in as best we can, Grant said as we both began to walk down the street and with bows at the ready. Brandy and Grace both nodded and sat in the SUV together with the girls, watching us walk away. The anxiety on my mind was substantial as we entered the fog and made our way past the very outskirts of town. Various screams and screeches could be heard deeper inside the city's limits. Based on the population written on the sign, it wasn't a huge place, but it wasn't small either. Grant and I kept close to the buildings, trying to keep ourselves as hidden away as we possibly could as we moved forward. The further past the welcome sign we got, the density of the fog seemed to increase, and our visibility was dwindling. It slowly became a chore to control my breath and attempt to remain calm and collected. Every sprint to the next form of cover exposed us to the possibility of being seen by one or more of the creatures. On top of that, we had no map or previous knowledge of how the town was laid out, so we were traveling blindly. Any guesses on where the town square might be? I finally asked Grant in a whisper, after we had made our way past a few intersections. Shit, man, I was about to ask you the same thing. Just then, another scream from one of the spider creatures rang out, followed by one more. Damn it. I really don't want to say this, but I think... I think we're going to need to start heading towards the scream of the spiders. Head first in danger, huh? Okay, man, I'm with you, Grant responded reluctantly. We both worked our way around the back of the house that we were up against and off in the direction of the screams. It was still another three blocks at any angle before we can get close enough to see anything. I approached the corner of a house and as Grant began to leapfrog around me like we had been doing to try to stay as tactical as possible, I threw my arm out, pressing it against his chest and pushing him back against the wall. As soon as his back hit the side of the house, he shot me a what-the-fuck-man look and I quickly pulled my hand from his chest and put my finger to my lips. I silently pointed out ahead of us, and I could see it in his eyes the second he noticed what I was pointing out to. Three little balls of orange glow danced back and forth along the ground as the flame spiders walked around. They seemed to be searching for something, but at the same time, their path seemed to be erratic and messy. It reminded me of the fact that you'd never really see a housefly flying in a straight line. I stepped back along the house a few times and pulled the small radio from my pocket and barely turned the volume up. I think we found the town square. Going radio silent, I'll turn it back on if we run into trouble. We have a few creatures to deal with, I said into the radio and shut it off before waiting for a response. I stepped back to Grant, who was watching the glowing fireballs looking spider creatures walk around in the open park area. Just as I was about to speak, a scream pierced the air and both Grant and I held our breath and pressed against the wall as a lurker walked past us a mere eight feet away. The pale skin of the lurker blending so well with the gray of the fog as it walked. This far in, the thick fog has darkened the sky and it seemed almost like dusk. A fact that I hadn't entirely noticed as we've been walking. One of the spiders screamed and another lurker screeched from further away. There's no way this is going to go any sort of well, shot through my mind as I looked into the park. Once the closer lurker had gotten far enough away, I leaned in and whispered to Grant as quietly as I could, and still allowed him to hear me. I really hope your aim is on point today, because, because we're going to need to be 100% on the same page to come out of this unscathed. We need to make every shot count and basically be two people, one mind. You with me? Grant took a big, deep breath and let it out slowly. And then another before looking me in the eyes and nodding. I'm with you. Let's do this. Okay. Look her first. Here we go. Grant drew his bow back as I knelt and grabbed the medium-sized rock and tossed it at the corner of the next house over. 
It hit with a crack and almost immediately the lurker turned around and was racing toward the sound. In that small amount of time, I also drew my bow back and we both held our aim trained on the creature as it prowled 15 feet away at the corner of the next house. I could hear the odd clicking noises the creature made and clicked my tongue to get it to refocus in our direction. I'm not sure how Grant knew what I was planning, but I'm so happy that he did. I clicked my tongue three more times and each click caused the lurker to move closer to us. I meant for the clicks to be a countdown, and on the third click, we both released. Both arrows hit the creature in the head, instantly killing it, and causing it to fall limp to the ground almost silently. My heart skipped a beat with joy. I was so happy with how well that worked. We may be able to pull this thing off, I thought. Just then, Grant got hit in the back by one of the flame spiders. We all focused so hard on the lurker, we didn't notice we had attracted more than just one. A second jumped and landed on him, and they each took a bite out of him. He couldn't resist and yelled out in pain. I almost knocked an arrow, but realized I couldn't shoot at them without hitting him. He flailed his arms trying to knock them off as they kept crawling all over him and taking bites out of him. I began starting to panic, but suddenly the memory of Grace jumping and stabbing one with just an arrow flashed in my mind, and I grabbed an arrow. Grant dropped his bow and caught one of the spiders by two of its legs. Just as he began to throw it over his head, I stabbed up between his hands, piercing the spider right through the middle. I spun and flicked the arrow, letting the spider slide off, flying through the air like it had just been launched from a catapult. As I turned back around, the third creature had joined in and I mistakenly locked eyes with it as I noticed it, sending me into a horrific, paralyzing flood of visions. Grant took another bite on the shoulder before grabbing the creature and throwing it at the one on the ground. The two of them collided and it broke my eye contact with the creature. My focus returned to the moment, just in time to get hit from the side by the remaining lurker, claws digging into my flesh, as it was all I could do to reach up and hold its head away, far enough to avoid getting stabbed by its flesh straws. Grant quickly picked up his bow and push-kicked the lurker off of me before knocking an arrow. As he took aim at one of the spider creatures, he locked eyes with it and winced as he was frozen with a mental assault. The lurker regained its footing and I had just enough time to pull a couple of arrows out of my bow-mounted quiver before it leapt at me again. I quickly buried the arrow into the side of its neck and its purple shimmering blood began to pour out as it backed up clearly injured. I scrambled to my feet and grabbed my bow. Quickly I knocked an arrow, aimed and fired at the flame spider, holding Grant at bay. It connected. Perfect shot. Right in the side of its head, instantly killing it and releasing Grant. He quickly pulled himself together and aimed at the lurker. He released the arrow and hit the lurker on the gills on the ribs. The lurker stumbled around before falling over, not completely dead, but quickly bleeding out. It tried its best to keep crawling and attacking to virtually no effect. The last spider jumped at Grant and he quickly sidestepped it, and it made contact with the wall behind him in a loud thud. It gave me enough time to knock another arrow, aim, and fire as it hit the ground. The arrow pierced the creature and it pinned it to the dirt. Grant promptly stomped on its head, crushing and killing the beast. Both of us stood breathing heavy looking around to see if there was any other creatures. Rattled from the battle that had just gone way off course of how I imagined it would go. Even with how poorly that battle had gone, I did realize that we both made it out alive and Grant had taken a few injuries. None of our wounds were all too severe. I quickly pulled out the walkie and clicked it on. The creatures are down. You're at the square. Which house are you in? Come out here and give us a sign. We're, we're out of time. We gotta go now. They almost shouted into the radio. We're coming. There's a white four-door Dodge truck sitting in front of the house we're in. It's got gas and a few supplies in it. Get in, and we'll get you out of here. The man responded over the radio. As soon as Grant heard it, he pointed off in the direction. There, let's go. We quickly grabbed all the arrows that we could salvage, which happened to be all except one, and ran off down the road to the truck that Grant had been pointing at. The couple came out of the house just as we reached the truck. He was a shorter, portly, blonde man covered in tattoos, and she was a short, skinny, dark-haired woman. We all scrambled into the truck, and he sped off as Grant directed him back out the way that we'd come. An enormous roar thundered through the air as we passed the welcome sign and raced out of the town and the fog. Other than Grant navigating our escape, we all sat in silence, most likely all still tense and unsure what to even say. Our almost two-hour journey into the depths of the town for our rescue mission only took a mere 15 minutes in the speeding truck to get us back out of there. The amount of relief I felt as we exited the fog and saw Grace and Brandy standing next to the other vehicles on the side of the road. When we got closer, the man pulled off on the opposite side of the two-lane highway. It was finally time for some proper introductions. Hey there, kids. It's me. 
Mr. Creepypasta. I just wanted to say thank you so much for listening to tonight's story or watching tonight's video. I appreciate it. As always, I cannot thank you enough for always being here. And if you guys would like to see more or hear more, then I'd appreciate it if you click that subscribe button. Or if you're listening on the podcast, then click the follow button. Do you like anime? I know that most people who use YouTube like anime. I'm looking at the stats right here. And they like it at a reasonable price. This is why our ongoing sponsor of the channel, High Dive, lets you start off with 30 days for free. So now you can watch anime, including horror anime, like Parasite, The Promised Neverland, and the Monster Masume. You can always find out more through the link in the description, or you can just head over to highdive.com. And as always, I want to give a big thank you to all you guys who support on Patreon, patreon.com slash MrCreepyPasta, especially Jacob Schaefer, Jay, Zach, Jordan Alexander Sanchez, Ken Landa Higuchi, Bobby Carmen, Tristan Pelton, Chase Burnett, Diana Krause, Katrina Beasel, Caden the Spooky Boy, Zane Nightshade, My Body Sounds Like Rice Krispies, Ashwood, Lord of the Weebs, Miss Exandra, Mr. Unsettling Spaghetti, Eurogore, Suji Campbell, Marco Takes Dabs 420, Frickin', Azarine Fox, Robert White, Andreas Garza, Snails Brennan, Legit Quad Feed, Fried Chicken 12, James Bruce, Chris Lovin, Freddy Krueger, Ty Nanny, Justin Johnson, 1-800-Nightmare, Unknown Nobody, Michael Scarborough, Jason Wilson, Infernal One, James Lowe, Lisa Cottrell, Jimbo the Hutt, Caspian, Jordan Nels, Hades Nephew, Plater Chip, Acid System, Prozac and Pancake Appreciation Society, Brian Arse, Cryptic Nightmares, Brennan Wright, Someone You Love, S-Man, Kiwi the Sloth, Liam Newman, Sky Harbor, Caleb Dougal, Nina Smith, Nico Kyle, Rafael Rodriguez, The Ginger Bros, Aaron Stormcrow, Talon Karlick, Daniel Polson, Trace Miles, and Cordy Kenshin. Thank you guys so much for supporting me, and if you guys would like to join them on the list of people's names I mispronounce, you can always do so at patreon.com slash mrcreepypasta, as well as all those fine people in the description down below who help support this channel and keep the lights on and give treats to Hylas and Hercules. You guys, as always, are the real MVPs. And I love and appreciate every single one of you who support there or just support anywhere by watching and subbing. So good night, everybody. And sweet dreams.